I don't want to be the boy that runs in the back I don't want to be the kid that falls in the dark All I really want to be is the guy that gets that girl Welcome to the AJ Steele Show. We discuss politics, sex, money, and everything in between. And now, here's your host, an immigrant, a self-made millionaire, an American, AJ Steele. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another great episode of the AJ Steele Show. Yes, I know I keep calling every episode great, but these shows are like my babies. And just like any parent who knows deep inside that his kids are not perfect in every conceivable way, they're still my kids, right? And we all love our kids equally, all four of them in my case. But loving our kids equally and the fact that good parents never play favorites doesn't mean that we don't have favorites. That one special kid who seems to be the most like us. He's the nicest or she's the nicest. And we just connect together on a different level. And for one reason or another, they seem to understand us better. And they drive us crazy a lot less frequently than the other kids. So in some ways, today's episode is just like that kid. It's equal to the rest. I love it just as much as I love all the others. But it's also uniquely special. Over the past couple of years hosting this show, I've had some incredible guests from White House whistleblowers to religious and political leaders to civil rights leaders. And we even talked to a wonderful lady named Juanita Broderick, who told us how she was brutally raped by Bill Clinton. But today's guest, Dr. Sheldon Roth, who happens to be a world-renowned psychiatrist and author and a Harvard Medical School professor, was in some ways the most challenging and the most fun interview I've ever had. Why, you ask? Because he wasn't just extremely smart and charming and funny and knowledgeable, but he also had real passion and he had so much to say and the things that he said sent a chill down my spine. Things about our future, things about my kids and things about your kids and all of their futures. So where do I start? Our show initially contacted Dr. Roth to talk about the effects of the coronavirus isolation and restrictions on our kids. And this is a topic that I've explored for a long time, and I talked about it before, and I really wanted to learn more about it, especially in the light of the fact that I have teenagers who missed out a year and a half of school, and a grandchild who missed out on a whole year of preschool. Look, I view this whole COVID lockdowns and this isolation that they that they enforced on us as a huge tragedy. And I'm not just talking about our kids and I'm not talking just about their mental status and development. I'm also talking about us, our economic well-being, our social emotional well-being, and even our physical well-being. But on a personal level, I watched one of my daughters miss her senior year in high school and her graduation and her prom and her first year of college. Not to mention the fact that We had to fight the college to try to keep her, a perfectly healthy girl and a student athlete, from having to take the vaccine that she didn't need and didn't want. And guess what? She had to take it or face expulsion. And this was told to her by the president of the university. But it wasn't just my daughter. I also had to watch my son miss his freshman year of high school. And I had to watch the two of them doing their homework on that damn computer, and I watched them living the life of hermits through no fault of their own. And they didn't complain. They did their best. But my heart was aching to see them that way. Every day during those horrible lockdowns, we tried to go on a hike or go on a drive. And we talked to our kids, and we tried to pass the time. But hanging around with your parents 24-7 is not a substitute for hanging out with your school-age friends and feeling alive and socializing and being young. And I remember every evening my wife and I talking about how helpless we were. We couldn't give them a normal life that they deserved, the normal life that they needed. We almost felt like parents of children in time of war who were helpless to save their kids from the bombs. But maybe that was the plan all along. Maybe our government wanted to create a situation where it itself became the only authority and completely relegated parents 
to impotent, hapless figureheads. The Nazis did this. The communists did this. And now the globalists. But getting back to our interview, I did my research. I wrote down my questions. And I felt that I was ready to tackle this gargantuan topic. But as Dr. Roth started talking, I just couldn't help myself. And I had to start asking him questions about the LGBTQ indoctrination of our kids. Because just in the past year, in my extended family alone, we've had one 20-year-old boy who decided he wants to become a girl. And we've had several high school girls who announced to their parents that they're now officially lesbians. Not to mention the fact that there's a couple of teenage girls on my block where I live who have started taking hormones and are telling anyone who will listen that they are now men. Look, even when I was in high school in the late 80s, we always had at least one gay kid or some girl who acted very peculiar. And that was fine. No one cared. But now this whole thing seems like a pandemic, at least amongst white liberal kids. And this pandemic, in my opinion, is just as manufactured as the COVID pandemic. And to me, it seems like it's just as dangerous. So naturally, my conversation with Dr. Roth just took off from there. And I'm sure that most other hosts would have tried to wrangle this whole conversation back to where it was supposed to be. But I got swept up in the good doctor's words, and we got into this freewheeling discussion that ended up being one of my favorite AJ Steele show interviews of all time. We talked about his book, Psychologically Sound, The Mind of Donald J. Trump, which was published by Bombardier Books and was distributed by Simon & Schuster. And then we had a lively discussion about the trans movement and LGBTQ indoctrination of our kids. And we touched a bit on the Holocaust. And finally, we actually got to hear his opinions and observations about the COVID lockdowns. And those were some of the most consequential words in the whole discussion. So in many ways, what you're about to hear is not a single show, but three or four shows that rolled into one. And even though those topics seemingly are very different from one another, the sharp listener will notice that there is a common thread running through all of them. It's all about control. Government control of our minds, government control of our families, government control of our bodies, and government control of our destinies. Now, before we get on with our interview, I have a little business to do as usual. And as you know, our show is completely self-sponsored, self-funded, and I will never ask any of you for any money because that's just not what the AJ Steele show is all about. But I do have to ask you and remind you to please subscribe to our show. And if you haven't done so already, to please tell all your friends about us. We're available on iTunes and Spotify and Google Podcasts and iHeart and all the other major podcast providers. The fact that you listen and subscribe to our show helps our overall rankings. And that's the reason why our episodes are always in the top 40 of podcasts in America and all over the world. You can call it vanity. You can call it a sense of mission. But I want us to stay up there. And I want to keep spreading our word to a lot of people. It's very important to do that because we're the only ones who do what we do. We're the only ones who dare to say things that we're saying because we're not corporate. We're not controlled. We're not sponsored by anybody. And so we have a bit of latitude, a bit of freedom that is very rare in a major podcast these days. And the only way to do what we're doing and to continue having impact is to stay on top of the charts. I also wanted to tell you about exciting new things that are happening to our show. We've recently had an interview with a writer for a major newspaper, and we're so excited about it because the writer actually seemed very friendly and sincere, and I have a feeling that she's going to do a great job. And I also wanted to tell you that we're working on a very unique show with a former guest of ours, Rabbi Michael Barclay, and he just published a wonderful new article in the American Thinker magazine. And he came up with a completely new angle on the abortion debate. And trust me when I tell you that shows about abortion can be a minefield because of all the raw emotions and all the strong feelings involved. But I think that the rabbi's new perspective could potentially lead us to a new way of looking at that debate. Listen, I don't want to give up the next show completely because I want you to listen to it. So I better stop right now and take our first break. And I hope you stick around to hear our a wonderful interview with Dr. Sheldon Roth because it's a real gem. This is AJ Steele, 
and you're listening to the AJ Steele Show. The AJ Steele Show. Think of your loudmouth best friend, hated by all the wives, because he tells it just like it is. Dr. Roth, welcome to the AJ Steele Show. I'm delighted to be here. Well, it's great to have you with us, and I know that you have a long history as a Harvard Medical School professor, a published author, and a doctor who spent many years as a practicing psychiatrist. Would you tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself? Um, well, professionally, for our purposes, I have a very extensive background. In particular, since I know one of your questions is about the impact of the lockdown on children, I should mention that for several years at the National Institute of Health, I was the director and administrator of the Adolescent Inpatient Division, uh, which is in the Family Studies Group uh, at that time. I fortunately never ran into Dr. Fauci in the building, <laughs> but he was there. He was there. So I'm familiar with all those politics. But I spent many years in full-time practice. Um, for several years, I was full-time at Harvard, but I disliked the administration so much. I was really in psychiatry to see patients. So I moved into full-time private practice and continued to teach at Harvard at the medical school, um, was the assistant clinical director at the Massachusetts Mental Health Center for several years, which at that time was both the Harvard's teaching unit for psychiatry and a world-class referral center. So I've had extensive experience with inpatient psychiatry of all levels, with interest in family study, uh, I'm also a psychoanalyst, was a training psychoanalyst, which is one of those high priests of that strange cult. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I retired from practice about 10 years or so ago. I, I'm 83 year now. And um, in general, focused primarily on seeing patients and teaching. I don't know if that answers and gives you uh, a general uh, format. Uh, so a wide range of psychiatric difficulties was my interest, in particular, how to do therapy and what's therapeutic. But AJ, this is not even why you <laughs> you asked me on the program. You wanted me to talk about the lockdown and children, so I hope I'm not going stray. You, you just tell me what you want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, I have so many questions for you, and I want to ask you about the Donald Trump book that you wrote. I want to ask you about the COVID lockdowns, obviously, but I wanted to start with an issue that a lot of the listeners are bringing up to me, and a lot of them happen to be parents and grandparents, and they're very concerned about their children and grandchildren and the direction that they're headed in in this new America. In the old days, we had to worry about TV and friends, bad friends, troublemaker friends that used to teach our kids bad things and fill their minds with perversity and deviancy. But these days, I worry more about teachers and government and doctors who you would think should know better. It wasn't all that long ago that things like homosexuality and even more specifically, people who suffered from gender dysphoria were considered to be mentally ill and in need of treatment. And yet now they're being celebrated and promoted as normal. And in many ways, our kids are being encouraged to become like them. It's one thing to have empathy and to not abuse people who suffer from mental illness. But it's an entirely different thing to normalize it and actually encourage the normal population to become, for a lack of a better word, infected with that insanity. As you can tell, I am not the most politically correct guy in the world, but I personally still consider these behaviors to be manifestations of mental illness. In your opinion, did the real science actually change, or is this some kind of a polysocial, financially driven abdication of science? 
You know, medical science and science in general is enormously shaped by culture. And uh, about a year and a half ago, the New England Journal of Medicine, which is probably the preeminent medical publication, had an interesting editorial, a long article on the medicalization of social opinion. Mm. And, then, and, and they had s- several diseases that were formally called diseases that were shaped purely by the political and cultural needs of the time. The prime one they talked about there is homosexuality, which was given a long list of reasons why that was true pathology in, in human nature. But as the culture changed, it became dropped as a diagnosis. So medicine has a long history of illnesses and diseases that were formally disordered and then culture changed them. Now, when it comes to the gender dysphoria, there always was a very, 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 very tiny, small percentage of developing children who were very confused about them. I remember in the early 1950s, and believe it or not, I was alive and kicking at that time. (laughs) It was front page news for a person named Christine Jorgensen. Christine Jorgensen went to Sweden and had all sorts of transfiguring surgeries. Her picture was all over the front pages for weeks on end when she returned. But this was like a rarity. Everybody focused on this as an extraordinary rarity. Now, we have moved into a politicalization of a formerly rarely occurring instance into like an epidemic of gender dysphoria. I want to presage this by saying recently, the Academy of Medicine in France made up a large public statement concurring with what I'm just saying, that only in exceptional, very exceptional cases, is there any indication for some kind of intervention, but that by and large, anyone referred for puberty blockers, surgery, these cases should be treated with extreme, extreme medical caution. What other countries have come out similarly? The United Kingdom, Britain, Sweden. And remember, Sweden throughout my life has been the forerunner of sexual freedom of some sort. Sweden has came out the same way as the Academy, French Academy came out. Finland has come out. Now, what does the American come out with? I'll bet you, sitting there in your nice little abode in San Francisco, you never heard the acronym OPA, O-P-A, right? OPA means Office of Population Affairs. Now, doesn't that sound very Sovietish or communist? This happens to be a major office under the auspices of the HHS, the Health and Human Services. And I'll give you one guess who runs it single-handedly. A very famous doctor by the name of Dr. Rachel Levine. Hmm. So, Opa, when, when Biden recently came out in support of all this gender interference, what document was he quoting from? He was quoting from Oprah's document written single-handedly by Dr. Rachel Levine with a plethora of incorrect, I wouldn't, I hesitate to say there were lies, but let's say distortion about the nature of gender dysphoria in a child. And one of them is uh, something that many practitioners who have making money off this process, let's remember. I'm not a Marxist, but Marx once said something that I have found true throughout my life. And he didn't write this in the Communist Manifesto. He wrote a book that nobody quotes anymore, but I happen to have read it. It's called The Sociology of Knowledge. And in it, he says, all art and all science reflect the means and tools of production. 
That's a fancy way of saying, follow the money, and then you'll see what pieces of science are supported or what pieces of art are supported. So many people are making a lot of money, and many drug companies are making a lot of money off these products. So one of the, what are one of the major distortions in his um, in, in Rachel Levine's uh, magnus opus of Opa, um, he, <laughs> say, he says that these children will commit suicide unless they're interfered with. Well, a lot of studies have shown that number one, gender dysphoria, which as a transient um, a psychological influence in a child, occurs in many children. But 80 to 90 percent of such transient feelings disappear by the time they are young adults and remember it only with fond amusement. Because as you can remember your own childhood, you imagined you were Captain Marvel or you were this or you were that or you were a fireman. It's part of growing up. You pull and tear at different pieces of your personality and test them out. But eventually you, you decide you go in a particular direction. So number one, it's not true that it remains. But even more importantly, what they hammer the parents with and what they frighten the parents with and get the parents to move with is that they say your, your son, your daughter or your it, whatever they're calling it, is going to commit suicide. Well, statistical studies have shown that adolescents who experience gender dysphoria are no more subject to um, suicide than are the uh, average uh, person who shows up for, for mental uh, difficulties. So this distorted paper, our president of the United States had the gall, ignorance, and senile dementia to announce to the nation that he, this man, supports you know, this medical intervention, whereas most of Europe has already made official public statements to the contrary. It sounds like the insane are running the asylum. That's where we're at. And uh, just to set the record straight, I wanted to let you know that when I was growing up, I wanted to be Elvis. I just wanted to get that out of the way. You move your head a little. I think I see Frankie, blue eyes, right behind you. That is Frank Sinatra. My daughter bought that for me. Between the two John Waynes. Between Correct. So my kids are weird. I don't know. Maybe I'm talking to a psychiatrist. Maybe you can help me with them. They're wonderful kids. In other my words, they're kids. They're not weird. They're kids. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, yes, they are the greatest kids in the world. And yes, they're also very goofy. <laughs> I guess the apple didn't fall far from the tree. You are listening to the AJ Steele Show, where no topic is off limits. No discussion too harsh. No truth more true. The AJ Steele Show. We tell it like it is. All I really want to be is a guy that gets a girl. All I really want to be. Now, speak of kids, my question to you is, why do you think it's so easy to get such large groups of them, and even adults for that matter, to agree with with these concepts that, in my opinion, are not only illogical, but they go against the natural order. And in many ways, they go against our most basic survival instincts. What is it that makes human beings so pliable? You know, you touch on what I think is one of the major uh, dilemmas of, of our time which is how on earth in the United States of America Marxist ideology has framed the thinking of so many university faculty, so many high school faculty, and at this point has even infiltrated down to uh, elementary school teachers. How has that framework become embedded? Because Part of what this gender dysphoria and sexual fixation with children, um, behind that is the notion that the teacher, the professor, the ideologue in the street, we all know much better than your family 
than your mother and father as to what's good for you. Don't listen to them. I'm telling you, you want to be a boy. I'm telling you, you want to be a girl. Well, last week in the Daily Mail in London um, newspaper, a scandal broke out that something like 150 autistic children at the elementary school level were told that they were a different gender and they went back to their homes to ply their parents um, uh, to intervene and intervention had begun. And all this was done primarily by elementary school teachers with autistic children, very pliable children. So where on earth, what is it about this philosophy? One basic element that I'm driving at here is it separates the child from the family. That is a Marxist aim. Lenin famously said, give me your children for two years to teach them and I will plant seeds that will never be uprooted. And so the emphasis is on transforming children. Uh, of course, a separate issue is the, the CRT issue, but all it basically does is want to separate the child from the family and become under the wing of big government, Marxist government. It's a completely different philosophy from the American government, which was based in many ways on religion and morality. I think it was um, John Adams who said that um, our entire constitution is based on religion and morality, and without it, it wouldn't survive. So this Marxist philosophy is a completely different nature. I taught for a number of years in Russia. Uh, once uh, perestroika, once the Soviet Union fell, all I wanted to do was to learn about Western psychiatry. So about once a year, I went to Moscow for a week and St. Petersburg for a week. I spoke to many Russians and they talked to me about how the, in their youth, the government attempted to draw them away from their family. And many of them had informed on their family falsely and regretted it. So there is in the Marxist philosophy an attempt to move the individual out of the family influence and under the government umbrella. But this is a, this is a separate larger topic. You know, I, I'm not truly qualified to speak on it. I think a sociologist might. I'm more qualified to give an opinion on it. Educated as it is, it's just an opinion. So I've been puzzling about that, how that happened over the many years. Um, and what about the nature of American life so allowed this flagrant growth of, of an anti-American uh, philosophy? And that's, of course, I think where Trump becomes a powerful pinpoint for those in America who wish to maintain John Adams' sort of view of things or, or the founding fathers if I can use that word fathers anymore, <laughs> um, offered to us. I am the grandson of Holocaust survivors. And for many years, I thought that the Germans were a unique people to have become so uh, enmeshed in such a religion of hatred. I call it a religion or a dogma or whatever. I really had that feeling. They were a unique people. And the more I live, and now I see it here in California, in America, it shocks me to see any human being or most human beings for that matter as a group, as a social group, they can be pushed to do anything. And it really scares me. Now, naturally, the next step in a progression of deviancy, and I know we're a little bit off topic, but we'll get back if you don't mind into it. No, no. Once you mentioned the Holocaust, you've got me. You've got me. In 1990 in Jerusalem, they had the first international symposium on the impact of the Holocaust on those not directly involved. In other words, children uh, or the rest of, of, of a nation. And I was selected as the American representative to speak to that point. It was, I think, the most powerful professional experience I've had in my life. It lasted a week. There were speakers from all over the world. Um, one of the speakers, though, 
was the president of the German Psychoanalytic Association. And for the first time ever, there were German representatives to a Holocaust meeting. When you mentioned what you felt about the, <laughs> the Germans, the rage that came out toward these German representatives, and some of them were the children of Nazis. Now they were psychiatrists and analysts. It was an extraordinary experience, extraordinary. Um, so I feel for you directly as soon as you say that. And I remember that there was nothing they could do. Let me just tell you the title of the paper of this president. You want to know about German's uniqueness? This guy's title, God rest his soul, was Auschwitz as a metaphor. The title alone wow. drove them crazy, drove them crazy. So I agree with you that there's something unique. This guy was the president of the Psychoanalytic Association coming to Jerusalem, and he didn't comprehend why that would be such an upsetting title for what he wanted to talk about. But let me not distract you. Go ahead, AJ. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're going in all kinds of directions, and you right. know, we, we could talk about uh, Holocaust syndrome and this and that. As a grandson of, of the Holocaust, I was never there. I just heard the stories from my grandma, and I still live with it, which is shocking. I don't know if it's in my genetics or whatever, but that's for another show. I wanted to get back to deviancy just a little bit and the fact that it seems like we're normalizing pedophilia. That's the next step in this stuff that we're talking about. Years ago, I worked with mentally ill and incarcerated men, and most of them told me that they were molested in childhood by gay men. And that they had feelings of guilt and shame subsequent to that, and that feeling ruined their lives. Why do you feel that our society today is starting to normalize pedophilia? Is there, is it some kind of a movement to destroy morality and religion, like you said? Or, you know, in the 60s, they said, let's burn everything down. Or is it just a function of selfishness and hedonism? It's all of those things, I'm afraid. I don't think you could single out one thing. But once again, if we're talking about a great cultural move, it's linked to why Marxism has become so popular. It has something to do with destruction of old norms. You know, Marx's theory was everything had to be destroyed. And Mao, when he instituted the Cultural Revolution in 1966 or 67, that was his idea, to destroy the entire past. And that's what, the, uh, that's what they did in Cambodia. Anyone who had an education or who knew a foreign language, anyone who spoke of some traditional form of life was murdered. And only the ignorant survived. Um, it's connected in some ways. What you said about the people you work with all had, the, or virtually most all, had history of severe trauma, sexual or physical, in their childhood. This goes back to one of the terrible impacts of the lockdown. The first thing I thought of when they announced this lockdown was, oh my God, what are they going to do in all those homes where there's physical abuse, sexual abuse, and the child can no longer escape to school? What the lockdown did, reports are starting to come out now. And a recent study demonstrated that almost 50% of adolescents who were involved in the lockdown reported significant parental abuse, physical, sexual, or emotional. 50%. Now, in suicidal adults, you'll find a similar high percentage of suicidal people have a history of similar family, home abuse. Wow. Um, so what I'm saying is, I think we're going to see another epidemic that's not viral in 10 or 15 years that will be related to this large group of children. And let's look at a, a wicked number here, AJ. 55 million children were caught up in the lockdown. 55 million children, American children, were caught up in the lockdown. So if I want to be generous and take 50% of that, I'm talking about 25 million children who now have a great risk factor 
for depression and suicidal behavior. And whatever induced the lockdown, I think is the same governmental overreach that's a reflection of a Marxist philosophy. Sweden, which had no lockdown, no masks, schools operated as ever. In terms of hospitalization, deaths, they rank in the middle. It's not like they're the worst or the best. Many studies have shown the lockdowns per se did not influence the trajectory of the virus. So what I'm getting at is that all I think all these things are connected as to why there should be this proclivity toward normalizing what formerly was seen as aberrant behavior. And it's more than that. I grew up in New York City, a frequent Greenwich Village. I was familiar with all sorts of people who lived all sorts of sexual lives. There were gay clubs where dressing in drag and going through the streets. But nobody was telling me I had to be gay. Nobody was telling me I had to be a woman. There was something about all those people, whatever their sexual proclivities were, they respected boundaries. And that notion of a dissolution of boundary and whatever I think is what you should think is once again the breakdown of American opinion and freedom. Um, I remember when I was used to go and teach in, in Russia, what I was astounded was the quality of silence when I would give a lecture, a discussion. In America, I would give the same lecture and everybody would tell me how wrong I was, how right I was, I didn't know what I, everybody had an opinion. If there were 30 kids in the room, there were 30 opinions. And I realized they were all afraid to confront the authority. They had all grown up in that attitude. And the Black Lives Matter movement, while it has all its obvious importance in terms of the history of America, to assert that whatever they thought about white supremacists and racists was absurd, but the boundaries were broken. There's no respect for another person's opinion and way of being. Um, there will be a backlash. It will begin in 2022, and then fought. It's like the final apocalyptic battle will be in 2024. <laughs> You're starting to sound like a, a biblical man. I think that, yeah, yeah. right? That I think that in many ways, what you're saying is absolutely correct. It's the loss of morality. And you can tie it to religion if you'd like to, if you are a believer, or you can tie it to a system of laws. Uh, you can believe in mosaic laws without necessarily being a religious person. But there is right and wrong, and we've crossed that line. AJ Steele, not right, not left, just right. Don't now, I could talk for hours about why the lockdowns happen and why I think they're completely unnecessary from a medical standpoint. And I know you just started talking about kids with bad families, but two of my kids, they're two of those 55 million that you were talking about. And I'd like to think that we didn't abuse those kids in the last couple of years. But what are your thoughts on their mental health as it relates to the lockdowns? And do you feel that there's a long-term damage done to them as well? I, I have many thoughts on this. First of all, for those of your listeners who are statistically inclined, the fact of the matter is that certain diagnoses are now being observed in studies I've looked at because they're only just coming out, uh, certain mental health disorders have doubled in number from pre-pandemic, particularly anxiety disorders, terrifying feelings with sleepless nights and volatility uh, and depression have doubled in numbers from pre-pandemic. And this is all coming out of the lockdown. That's an inescapable conclusion. Teachers who uh, have begun to report that young children in particular returning to school, they're shocked by the fact that they lack basic skills that they used to see 
Kids don't know how to tie their shoelaces, don't know how to open bottles, and more importantly, don't know how to share. There's a lot of pushing, shoving. They don't understand how to have a group discussion. They interrupt. And here the boundary thing is interesting. There's a lot of touching, grabbing, and hitting. A lot of aggressiveness that experienced teachers had never formally seen in such age groups. So socialization uh, has been distorted. In particular, just picture a deaf child. Everyone's got masks. How is the child going to learn speech? Deaf children in particular uh, have been severely uh, handicapped. A month or two ago, I was in a toy store buying for our six grandchildren, (laughs) who are, I'm sure, equally as weird as yours. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know about that one. (laughs) So I was in a a toy store buying stuff for my grandchildren. Everyone in in, in the toy store was in masks, including the owner, whom I know. But there was a a little girl in a stroller, maybe a year and a half, and she was behind me in the payout line. And I looked at her, and she... She had this like glum look staring at me with my black mask. And so I pulled down my mask and I smiled at her. And she lit up like a light bulb. It was suddenly a whole new world. And then she, and then she became a game of peekaboo. She wanted me to pick it up and down. And later when we were in the street, I realized that about a half a block away, that little girl was in the stroller moving to me and she was waving to me. So what I went through my mind was, prior to seeing my face, I was just one of these inanimate zombies, and she had this glum look on her, and she became alive when she could see that. Now, that's one tiny few second interaction. People, as you know, vary in their capacity to understand things. There were people so terrified by the mainstream media's um, epidemic, I would call it, of you're all going to die if you don't do this, that people kept their children in the house, never visited their relatives. I read about one family that had a two-year-old that had never seen the grandparents, the cousins, anyone. To this day, they're still keeping that child in the house because they're terrified. Now, that's not physical abuse. That's not uh, sexual abuse. But emotionally, unknowingly, these parents have damaged that child. But on a larger scale, one that frightens me is that four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old kids have watched their mothers and fathers, if they have an intact home, succumb. Daddy, how come we can't go out? The president says we can't. Daddy, how come you can't go there? Or why can't I go there? They've been inculcated with government overreach, government tyranny. In their minds, it's correct to do whatever the government says, whatever the... Tyranny has been imprinted in their mind. Let me remind you of a classic conditioning study. You take a little duck, a duckling, in the first several days or week of its birth, and you present it with a wooden duck, it will follow that duck. Later when it develops, it doesn't follow the mother duck. It follows the wooden duck. So I thought to myself, all these children who have watched their mothers and fathers succumb to government power, that's their notion of what a person should be in relation to the government. No question. 100% acceptance, that nefarious influence is going to interdigitate with the Marxist philosophy, America's going to have hell on wheels as these children develop in a very confused state. I think you're talking about classical conditioning. Yes. Uh, What you're saying is truly frightening, doctor, and I've seen it myself too. I've been very lucky that Mrs. Steele and myself, we didn't succumb to this craziness. We went out every day when, you know, we went on hikes, we did things, we lived our lives and we taught our kids right from wrong. But when they interacted with their friends, they got exactly all the information that the government wanted to hear. 
Now, we can talk about developmental stages and this and that. I, I took psychology at some point a, a million years ago. Piaget, I think it was. Do you think these kids who missed out on things like nonverbal cues and how to function on a social setting, do you think they can relearn that or do you think this is gone for good? Well, I, quite frankly, I think it depends upon the age that it happened. Now, if you take a 12 or 14-year-old kid, they had long experience before of another kind of life. So they're kind of waiting for it to return. But you take a two or three or a four or five-year-old kid, two, two and a half years of this, I think will have a significant impact. It remains to be seen. I had an idea for a great study for our young man, because you're a grandchild of a Holocaust survivor. In other words, you know from long experience that you don't trust the government, like all those Berlin Jews who thought this would pass, right? Hungarian Jews in my case. Oh, my grandmother was Hungarian. Ah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> be very interested to see if the children of Holocaust survivors and grandchildren of Holocaust survivors wind up with a different attitude toward government and government overreach than people who may not have it bred into their bones, don't trust them and watch out what they say. Um, I suspect there's a different wariness or a different uh, ability to split the difference about government in people whose family history has had directly impacted. I think what you're saying about the Holocaust is correct. And I've heard these kind of same feelings in people that came from communism. Yes, the Cubans in Miami. Who are you kidding? Not me. The Cubans in Miami get it. They definitely do. Now, as you know, certain cultures are, or religions, they also have a natural affinity to ask a lot of questions. So that's a whole different issue we can talk about. But some people are just a questioning type. I think it's just a cultural thing. The AJ Steele Show. Think of your loudmouth best friend, hated by all the wives, because he tells it just like it is. Finally see your love belongs to me. Doctor, you came into my attention when you wrote what many in the media consider to be a highly controversial book called uh, Psychologically Sound, The Mind of Donald J. Trump. And I personally still remember a lot of activists, pseudo-psychiatrists and psychologists writing books and articles about the supposed pathology of Donald Trump's mind and his many psychoses. They were not only analyzing him based on their political agendas, which is what it was, and I would call it quack psychoanalysis, but some of them were actually performing medical malpractice, in my opinion, because they gave him medical diagnoses without ever doing a real evaluation. What made you write your book, and what were your conclusions? Well, first of all, you pick up on several very interesting and important angles, particularly, um, you could call it malpractice. I would call it malevolent <laughs> use of psychiatry, very similar to what went on in the Soviet Union. When you have a political difference, you declare the person insane, put them in a hospital and shock them and drug them, which is what they did in the Soviet Union. Uh, and we were moving in that direction here. Uh, my book, which is called Psychologically Sound, The Mind of Donald J. Trump, says it all in the title. The man is psychologically sound. But I wanted to write a book that was not filled with psychiatric diagnoses, I get into a diatribe with all my colleagues. I wanted to write a book that people could read, that people could understand, and understand in terms of everyday human experience. So the book has a lot to do with Trump as a person, Trump in his love life, Trump in his business life. And in many ways, leave it to the reader to think, is this a man with this entire background? that you could say is psychiatrically disordered? Uh, the answer obviously is no. And in just one small section, do I take up the psychiatric diatribes of my colleagues and try and refute them. But why did I write that book? 
there was a man, may he rest in peace, a very eminent, uh, what we would call a forensic psychiatrist, um, a deep inhabitant of the deep uh, of the deep DC swamp. <laughs> uh, he had been in this a psychiatrist. He had been in the CIA for 21 years, growing up personality profiles of dictators um, in regimes which our government opposed. Uh, he wrote the personality profile on Saddam Hussein, on Kim Jong-un's a father, wrote a number of books. And in my retirement, I suddenly get a call from him. Uh, I knew who he was, but I had never spoken to him. And what did he want? He is an ardent Democrat, as you might imagine, if he spent 21 years <laughs> in the CIA. Naturally, yes. And he also developed a program in political psychology at uh, George Washington University in, in D.C. He, as an ardent Democrat, had heard from some of his colleagues in D.C. that I was a conservative. Who he talked to, I don't know how people would even know that. Because I've, <laughs> I've, I've never been politically active. I was immersed in, in the clinical treatment of people. Um, he had a great idea. As an ardent Democrat, he wanted to write a book with an ardent conservative so that we would have a dialogue. Because he mm. felt that the, a key difficulty in the nation was the inability of people to talk to one another. So... I thought he had a great idea, but quite frankly, I didn't want to do it. He wanted me to write about Trump because I knew next to nothing uh, about Trump. I grew up in New York. I was born there, lived there for the first 27 years of my life. And I knew he had this big building uptown and he was a real estate guy. <laughs> Other than that, I, I knew nothing about him. That was the full extent of it, huh? Real estate. That was guy. the extent. That was the extent. Because I didn't read the daily news where he was frequently uh, pictured. <laughs> so it seemed overwhelming to me. And I told him that I didn't want to do it. But a number of people said, this is an important time in history. You've got to put your two cents in. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought it's correct. You know, I can't be a passive citizen. If I'm not active in politics per se, I have to make a contribution. So I spent a year and a half trying to write this book with him. But he lived in Bethesda, where actually I lived many years ago. And I live in Los Angeles, where my whole family is. And I thought, um, if I had been in Bethesda, we might have finished it. But he, for various reasons, was not writing much. I had written several chapters. and. I finally pulled out of it and told him it wasn't working out as a joint book. But as I tried to put the chapters away in a drawer, I thought to myself, I like that first chapter. I really would. I hate to put this one, deep six this one. I had this image that after my demise sometime in the far, far future. Of course. Uh, my sons would open this drawer, find this chapter, the one on, on Citizen Trump about his love of the book, uh, Citizen Kane. I figured they'd see this chapter and they'd say, God, Dad wrote this. Why did he just leave it in the drawer? So I decided I'll try and write my own book. And I spent several months reading everything Trump had ever written, seeing interviews, reading other people, and suddenly found as Kissinger said, and it's remarkable for Kissinger to say this about Trump, whom he detested, he says, a man like this occurs at only certain moments in history and is infinitely constituted to meet the crisis of the time. And only such a personality uh, made like that could meet the challenges of the time. Um, and that's what I came to the conclusion of that somehow he was the quintessential leader of a particular movement. He captured in his thoughts and behavior the essence of what a good deal of this country uh, felt. Henry Kissinger, I'm not a big fan of his, but no one can doubt how brilliant the man is. And I think he's in his 90s now. Now, yes, is, yeah. now interestingly, a couple of weeks ago, I had a fascinating interview with Mike McCormick, who 
worked very closely with four presidents. And he told me that not only was Donald Trump the nicest of all of them, but despite all of his money and fame and notoriety, he probably had the most normal family life of all of them. So in many ways, your conclusions were very accurate. I recently had contact with a Secret Service agent who did serve several presidents in the White House. Going back, he did the Bushes, the Clintons, and Trump. And he was speaking for the general tenor and feel of the Secret Service. Of all the presidents they worked with, they most liked being with Donald Trump. So that confirms what you've just said. And that's from the mouth of a Secret Service guy. Doctor, this has been a great discussion. Could you please tell our audience where they could buy your book? And Oh, my book. It's uh, available on Amazon, Auditory, Kindle. They even have a CD of it now. Um, and it's also Barnes and Nobles, Good Read. But thank you for bringing that up. Oh, of course. And I know you have a very popular uh, Twitter account, too. What is your Twitter account, Doctor? Oh, my Twitter account is at Sheldon Roth MD1. At Sheldon Roth, it's one word, Sheldon Roth MD1. Yeah, Twitter has been like a new world for me. You know, retired, I suddenly have available all the all over the country that and people are so fascinating i learned so much that i could never know otherwise i i do have a final question for you and yeah. i ask the same question of all of our guests where do you see america headed do you think there's still hope out there for us or do you feel that we're done we're finished well it may be my nature which is basically an optimistic pessimist. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a new one. I felt just as I felt that Trump was a great voice for what's great in America. I feel he or some successor to him will return. I hope he's healthy enough. His father didn't get senile until he was about 89 or 88, and lived to be about 94. Wow. And he's quite vibrant. And so I'm hoping that he will take up the banner for the rest of us. And there are other good voices in Congress, Jim Jordan and other people. So I have hopes that all this will be challenged and redone. It's happening even in Black Lives Matter, being exposed for utilizing their funds for nefarious purposes, personal purposes. And I couldn't have imagined that a year ago. They would have killed you if you had ever mentioned that. Your house would have been firebombed. Mm. Um, so my answer is, I think America will write itself and will do what it can to integrate um, these eras of the past. Dr. Sheldon Roth, it was a, a great pleasure talking with you and I really appreciate your integrity and your honest perspectives and they're gutsy too. Thank you so much for coming on the AJ Steele Show, Doctor. Well, thank you, thank you, AJ. The AJ Steele Show, copyrighted 2022.